Thank you all very much for being here tonight and thank heaven or whatever other entity you want that we don't have to endure flooding in Campbell Hall the way we did uh, on Thursday. Uh, let me first then uh, introduce the two speakers. Uh, Professor William Lane Craig on my right, on your left, is a distinguished author and lecturer with two doctorates in philosophy and theology and master's degrees in philosophy of religion and church history. With over 80 articles and books in print on such topics as the existence of God, the resurrection of Christ, the Big Bang, and the Hartle Hawking cosmology, referring, of course, to Stephen Hawking and UCSB's own James Hartle, Craig understands the most important cosmological and religious topics of our time. He has made many video appearances and has lectured around the world. Professor Craig will present and advocate the Christian worldview. Professor Garrett Hardin, on my left and on your right, is Professor Emeritus of Biological Sciences at UCSB, and he is world famous for his penetrating discussions of bioethics in a number of books and articles intended for both scientific and general audiences. He is perhaps most famous for his essay, quote, The Tragedy of the Commons, end quote, addressing ecology, population science, and political science. The essay has been reprinted in more than 100 anthologies. Hardin's work, especially that on population and abortion, has been enormously influential. And Professor Hardin will present and advocate the worldview of scientific naturalism. Uh, before uh, uh, I uh, have the speakers speak for themselves, I want to give you an idea of the format uh, that we're going to use here. There will be an initial presentation uh, in which Professor Craig will speak for 18 minutes and followed by Professor Hardin, who will speak for 18 minutes. Then there'll be a first rebuttal of eight minutes for Professor Craig and eight for Professor Hardin and a second and final rebuttal uh, of five minutes for Professor Craig and five for Professor Hardin. That, after that, uh, we will then have questions from the audience. Um, uh, you come forward and, and um, I'm going to try to alternate, uh, so if you could let me know which, which uh, speaker you want to address your question to, then I can alternate between the two speakers. We'll come to that. Uh, later on. So at this moment, I think we're ready uh, to begin, and so um, I present uh, Professor William Lane Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking the Veritas Forum for inviting me to participate in this debate this evening. The questions that we're going to be talking about are of profound importance, and it's my hope that the discussion tonight will be a significant step forward in each of your own personal spiritual journeys. Now, when we ask the question, scientific naturalism versus Christianity, we're asking which of these two worldviews is true. Accordingly, we must conduct our inquiry on the basis of the nine fundamental logical laws of reasoning. And we need to ask ourselves the two questions. First, what reasons are there to believe that scientific naturalism is true? And secondly, what reasons are there to believe that Christianity is true? Well, with respect to that first question, by scientific naturalism, I mean the view that the natural world is all there is, and that we should only believe what can be scientifically proven. Now, think about the claim that the natural world is all there is. This claim is logically equivalent to atheism. But I can't even imagine how you could scientifically prove atheism. Since science only studies the natural world, how could science possibly prove that there is nothing beyond the natural world? The only way that the naturalist could hold this would be by faith. But then he would contradict his own view, which says that we should only believe 
what can be scientifically proven. And thus, his position seems to me to be internally incoherent. Now, consider that second claim, that we should only believe what can be scientifically proven. I submit that this claim is demonstrably false. First of all, it's too restrictive. There are all sorts of truths which we all rationally accept, but which cannot be scientifically proven. For example, mathematical and logical truths, metaphysical truths like the external world is real, ethical truths, aesthetic truths, and even scientific truths. The fact is that science itself is permeated by unprovable assumptions. For example, the theory of relativity, one of the twin pillars of contemporary physics, is based on the assumption of the constancy of the speed of light between any two points, A and B. But this is strictly unprovable. Uh, we simply have to make this assumption if we're to hold to the theory. And thus, it is simply too restrictive to contend that uh, we should only believe what can be scientifically proven. But worse than that, the naturalist claim is self-refuting. For consider the statement, quote, we should only believe what can be scientifically proven, end quote. Can that statement be scientifically proven? Well, obviously not. And thus the scientific naturalist's position refutes itself, and so it cannot be true. And thus, there seems to be no good reason to believe that the natural world is all there is, and there's certainly no good reason to believe that we should only believe what can be scientifically proven. In short, it's hard to see any good reason to think that scientific naturalism is true. So what about that second question? Are there any good reasons to think that Christianity is true? By Christianity, I mean the view that God exists and that he has revealed himself decisively in Jesus Christ. Now, I'd be the first to admit that you can't prove uh, compellingly these two claims, but I do think they can be shown to be reasonable, and in fact, more reasonable than their denials. Take that first claim that God exists. I believe that there are in the natural world certain signposts of transcendence, as it were, which point beyond the natural world to a greater reality as its ground. For example, signpost number one, the origin of the universe. The astrophysical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist in a great explosion called the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. Physical space and time were created in that event, as well as all the matter and energy in the universe. Therefore, as the Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, the Big Bang theory requires the creation of the universe from literally nothing. Now, this tends to be very awkward for the naturalist. For as Anthony Kenney of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. And from the very nature of the case as the cause of space and time, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. Isn't it incredible that the Big Bang Theory thus fits in with what the Christian theist has always believed, that in the beginning, God created the universe? Now, I simply put it to you. Which do you think is more plausible, that the Christian theist is right or that the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing? I at least don't have any trouble assessing these alternatives. Signpost number two, the complex order in the universe. 
During the last 30 years, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself. We now know that life prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life permitting universe like our own. How much more probable? Well, the answer is that the chances that the universe should be life permitting are so infinitesimal as to be incomprehensible and incalculable. For example, Stephen Hawking has estimated that if the rate of the universe's expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, then the universe would have recollapsed into a hot fireball. PCW Davies has calculated that the odds against the initial conditions of the universe being suitable for star formation, without which planets could not exist, is one followed by a thousand billion billion zeros at least. John Barrow and Frank Tipler estimate that a change in the strength of gravity or of the weak force by even one part in 10 to the 100th power would have prevented a life permitting universe. There are around 50 such quantities and constants given in the Big Bang which must be fine-tuned in this way if the universe is to permit life. And it's not just each quantity which must be finely tuned. The ratios between these constants must also be exquisitely finely tuned. So improbability is multiplied by improbability by improbability until our minds are reeling in incomprehensible numbers. There is no physical reason why these constants and quantities should have the values they do. The one-time agnostic physicist Paul Davies comments, through my scientific work, I have come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing that I cannot accept it merely as a brute fact. Similarly, Fred Hoyle remarks, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. And Robert Jastrow, the head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, calls this the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. So once again, the view that Christian theists have always held that there is a designer of the universe seems far more plausible than the atheistic view that the universe, when it popped into existence, uncaused, out of nothing, just happened to be, by chance, fine-tuned for intelligent life with an incomprehensible precision and delicacy. Signpost number three, the existence of objective moral values in the world. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and naturalists alike agree on this point. For example, Michael Roos, a philosopher of science at the University of Guelph, explains, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist of the last century who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I think that we can. Rather, the question is, 
If God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? Like Nietzsche and Rus, I don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. After all, if there is no God, then what's so special about human beings? They're just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe in which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On the naturalistic view, some actions, say rape, may not be socially advantageous and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down, I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just uh, socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. But if objective values cannot exist without God, and objective values do exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that God exists. On the basis of these signposts of transcendence, it's reasonable to believe that there exists a creator and designer of the universe who is the ground and source of moral value. Moreover, I think it's reasonable to believe the specifically Christian claim that this God has revealed himself decisively in Jesus Christ. Here I want to share two further signposts. Signpost number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, with the authority to stand and speak in God's place. That's why the Jewish authorities instigated his crucifixion on the charge of blasphemy. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then we would have good grounds for believing that he was who he claimed to be. And there are, in fact, three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today which support the resurrection of Jesus. Let me say a word about each one of these. Fact number one, on the Sunday morning following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the resurrection, quote, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb, end quote. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent German New Testament critic Gert Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less a rising Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead before the end of the world. Luke Johnson, a New Testament critic from Emory University, muses, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, 
concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. Finally, signpost number five, the immediate experience of God. You can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by immediately experiencing him. Now, if this is the case, there's a danger that arguments for God's existence could actually distract your attention from God himself. If you are sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. So, in conclusion, we've not seen any good reasons to think that scientific naturalism is true. Moreover, we have seen five signposts of transcendence which point beyond the universe to its ground in a creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute goodness and has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Together, I think these provide a powerful cumulative case for the truth of the Christian worldview. Thank you, Professor Craig, and we now turn... We now turn to Professor Hardin's initial presentation. My presentation will be considerably different, I think, from the last speaker's, no doubt because my personal history is quite different. And I'm going to tell you a story I've never told before, a story from my childhood but I think it's probably uh, relevant to the points I'm going to try to develop. And I leave that up to you to see the relevance, so I'll try to point out things along the way. Uh, I begin my story in my childhood uh, when I'm, I'm told by my parents that I was one of these irritating, questioning children to age three, always asking why, 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 you know, it, go, it goes on until the parents think they'll go crazy, uh, and they give them some sort of an answer. Well, uh, the, I don't remember any of that. Three was a little too early for my memory to work. But uh, I do remember something that happened when I was either seven or eight. And I should make the point, because of the question I'm going to raise here, uh, that I did not come from anything that could even remotely be called a scientific background. My ancestors and relatives were farmers and some of them businessmen, no scientists, no engineers, nothing even remotely resembling that. So uh, whatever questions I raised came from my childishness rather than from my surroundings. Uh, this occasion that I remember very well was the occasion of a funeral in the family. I think it was my grandfather who had died and this was out in the country. We were on a 160-acre ranch, and relatives and a few friends came from considerable distances. And this was in the days of the Model T Ford and muddy roads. And having come that far, uh, they weren't about to go home in a hurry. So many of them stayed around for a week, uh, a little long for guests, but it was all in a good cause because everybody caught up on the gossip. and. Uh, of course, this being a very sexist world, uh, it divided into two camps. The women stayed in the kitchen and in the bedrooms doing the household chores while they caught up with the gossip in their way. The men uh, went hunting. They took the few dogs that were around and their guns and went hunting. And uh, But the talking it was probably not too different from what it was among the women. I don't know. I, I was only with the men. But uh, uh, I cannot give you the exact words, but I can certainly give you a feeling for, the, uh, for my feelings at that time 
and how they carried on. Uh, I was walking with my father through a, an abandoned orchard. This was in November or December. There was a light snow on the ground, and the dogs were misbehaving as usual, having to keep them behind the guns, which is always hard, uh, hoping to see a rabbit, and now and then we did see a rabbit. And I was walking with my father, and I, uh, making small talk perhaps, I said, I, I understand uh, that God made everything and all the people in the world. But what I don't understand is who made God? Now, I don't remember my father's exact words, but I do remember the, the atmosphere that developed. My father became very angry. I only saw him out of the corner of my eye, but I had the feeling his face was flushed. And he said in a very emotional voice, that's a question you must never, never ask. I got the idea. This was taboo. I didn't know the word taboo, but I got the idea. And from that day on, I never asked the question, where did God come from? Who made God? Because I realized you just don't ask that question. And thus, uh, I had to make do with what I could make of my own uh, cogitations. Well, you see, what's involved here is the idea of an infinite regress. You can say somebody else, uh, Zeus made God. Well, who made Zeus? Well, Thor made Zeus. And who made Thor? And you go on back and back and back. But you see, you never end this infinite regress. So this is no satisfactory, rational answer to a problem, an infinite regress. On the other hand, as a previous speaker pointed out, to get something from nothing is also very disturbing. I found these equally disturbing and never tried to uh, put my money on one or the other. I just felt this was a, a, a dead end and was largely not uh, interested in it. The part of the trouble, I think, is uh, moving on to more adult concepts. Whatever one means by God, you don't mean anything as childish as you start out with the idea an old man with a beard. And uh, of course, nowadays, you wouldn't dare do that anyway, because it should be an old woman. But uh, uh, in those days, uh, it just, uh, I, I thought of it as a person. I couldn't see any evidence for any person that could be called God. And nobody told me any. Nobody volunteered the information, either then or later. What this boils down to is a problem in words and the use of them. And I want to quote to you from a passage from the Bible, which I think is immensely wrong. This is a passage by John, Epistle to the Hebrews, in which he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. End of quote. Now I want to contrast that with the motto of the Royal Society. This is a Royal Society, essentially it's a scientific society in England. The Royal Society, which was founded in 1660. Their motto is nullius in verba, which is derived from uh, Horace, a poet of the first sentence, and uh, abstracted from a long passage, but the general uh, feeling people agree on, nullius in verba means there's nothing in words. You can't prove anything with words. There's no authority in words. Now, you see, that's utterly different from what John was saying, that the word was God. And this, of course, is absolutely basic to all of science. There's nothing in words. There's something behind the words, which we're trying to get at with words. And sometimes we fail. Sometimes we succeed. But it's always questionable. And one of the things we have to accept is that some of the greatest scientists have confessed uh, that they do not work with words, that these come later. These are the window dressing. Uh, Niels Bohr, who was the most important personality of the first half of the 20th century in theoretical physics, he inspired so many people. He set them on the right track to making Nobel Prize winners of themselves. When he was approached by a young man named Abraham Pice, 
Pice reported this contact this way. He said, the first thing Bohr said to me was that it would be profitable for me to work with him only if I understood that he was a dilettante. He explained how he had to approach every new question from a starting point of total ignorance. Now, you see, this is a great contrast with what one usually thinks of great scholars who approach things with all the knowledge and so forth and so on. And Bohr said, I'm just a dilettante. I'm just playing around. I don't know. Um, Einstein was approached several times, principally by Hadamard, who wrote a history or a, a, a treatise on the use of language in science uh, and how scientists worked. Uh, said the words or the language as they are written or spoken do not seem to play any role in my mechanism of thought. That's a pretty extreme statement for a man of Einstein's uh, standing to, to make. And on another occasion he said, I very rarely think in words at all. A thought comes and I may try to express it in words afterwards. And he said, the belief of certain people that thinking is always in words made him laugh. This I think we should take very seriously, and I think this is a way of operating not only among the giants in science, but also to a lesser extent, to the extent that they can, among the ordinary foot soldiers, that a great many of them do not operate with words, except at the last moment, so to speak. They're, they're operating with ideas, with visions of movement, of relationships, and so forth and so on. And somewhere along the line, before they can talk to somebody else, they have to put some words to it. And that, of course, is where the trouble may come in. Einstein, by the way, did not speak until he was three years old. So he'd ordinarily be classified as a backward child. And at nine, it was recorded, that he spoke with great reluctance in class, as though he were thinking a long time before he'd be willing to speak. You see, so this is a deeply ingrained thing. He was not talkative. I find that it helps to think of our way of uh, taking into ourselves the phenomena of the world, that we do this with three filters. The first filter is often called the literate filter or the verbal filter or the language filter. But let's say literate filter. And this, of course, must have been employed long before there was such a thing as literacy, that is reading and writing. The second filter did not come in until science started, I think. And this is the numerate filter. You asked how much, how many, how big, how small. And as soon as you did that, many things that you thought you had firmly in mind turned out to be rather different from what you thought. Now this, was grow uh, uh, this grew during about 2,000 years of the growth of science from the Greeks to the present time. And it was only beginning about a century ago that it was that, the filter, that a third filter was added finally in a very conscious way, and this is the one I call the, the equalate filter, the filter of ecology, the filter that deals with the relations of one thing to another, of the relative sizes and the consequences of that, uh, rates of change and the consequence of that, and the possibility of thresholds below which something won't happen, a whole bunch of things, but all dealing with relations of many variables. And this is, I think, characteristic of our time, and this is not fully appreciated. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that uh, happens to people who don't have the equalit filter at all, don't use it at all, is that they make projections of present trends into the future, and then they're surprised when they don't happen. Well, this has now become so widely recognized that we have a phrase for this. We speak of the unexpected consequences of actions. In other words, 
you have the theory that's very good indeed, and it predicts all sorts of things, but some things it just fails completely. They turn out to be quite different. And when you look back, you discover you didn't notice certain relationships to things outside of your system. And so the Eagle's filter says be sure uh, that you find out the relations between things as well as their names and their sizes. Now, it does seem to me that many of the things that religion deals with uh, are really have to be criticized as being just on the verbal level, that they are literate level. They're, they're words that are plausible, but beyond that you can't say very much. The, uh, they're sort of an informal approximation to the facts, to the ecology of the situation, to the total situation that, where unintended consequences happen. And this, I think, is true of words like spirit and intuition, sanctity, and God. I just don't think one can give any exact meaning to any of these. Uh, a part of the scientific attitude, a very important part, is found in Descartes' meditations, which sort of uh, which set the spirit of science in an important way. He said in the, the beginning of the meditations, which he wrote at age 46, he said, some years ago, I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely, to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundations if I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. In other words, he's saying one has to become as a child and look at it all over again. Uh, this is not easy to do. You have to take your doubts seriously and uh, face each one of them and don't at any point in desperation say, well, you just have to have faith in that. Faith is not, uh, I mean, to a scientist, faith is a form of vice. He doesn't indulge in it, not consciously. Uh, a friend of mine in Texas a few years ago, about a decade ago, told me of wonderful uh, bumper sticker that he was seeing all over the, his large city. The bumper sticker said, God says it, I believe it, that settles it. Now that, I think, is as far as you can possibly get from the scientific attitude. But it makes many people very happy, and so maybe it should be tolerated or even uh, encouraged. However, that isn't the scientific uh, spirit. And an important element of the scientific spirit was contributed by a French philosopher, Montesquieu, in 1721, when he wrote the Persian letters. He, did, he wanted to criticize many things in his world, and he realized that there was danger in criticizing them. Uh, they were not so far from the uh, Inquisition and other forms of violence uh, stimulated by religion that he was willing to take a chance. So he pretended, this is a story, story of letters, a Persian visiting France was supposed to have written home to his friends at home. And by pretending in that way, he could say all sorts of things that he otherwise couldn't have gotten away with. He commented, for example, he, he broke into it gradually, pointed out the very humorous thing that in France, the men wear trousers. Can you imagine that? You see, in Persia, it was the women who wore trousers, and yet these funny men wear trousers. And also the men had wigs, and, and they cut off their hair and they put wigs on. And that was a very curious thing to do. Then he said there is a magician at the head of the French government who can make two million crowns do the work of one million just by declaring a new value to the crown. So he's plainly a magician. And in Rome, there's another magician who can make three into one. And that, of course, is the Trinity. And Montesquieu did not dare to ridicule the Trinity, but he could have his Persian visitor do so. At any rate, this was an important step in the development of a more critical view towards literacy towards literate values. And 
It was continued by Adam Smith, who uh, in 1759, this is before he became an economist, uh, invented the idea of a disinterested spectator. He says, I divide myself, as it were, into two persons, and one of them is a disinterested spectator. And the word disinterested is meant in the economic sense, a person who has no economic or other interest, see, not, not intellectual interest, but uh, material interest in the outcome. And you have to be a disinterested visitor, disinterested spectator. Uh, very shortly thereafter, somebody invented the man from Mars, pretended, see, of course, this is just Montesquieu's Persian uh, visitor, but from a more distant place, and even more objective, I think you can say, than a Persian would be. And the man from Mars continues to the present day and is still a useful intellectual tool to use when you're trying to make yourself into a disinterested observer. Say, well, now, what would the man from Mars say about this? See, in other words, shed all your taboos and conventional beliefs and, say, and try to answer, what would he say about this? Uh, thank so, you very much, Professor Hart. So that, I think, is, presents the basis of the, in which I would say that we have to analyze this in terms of the language pathology rather than in terms of fact. Thank you very much. We now turn back to Professor Craig for eight minutes. Okay. Well, I appreciated very much Dr. Hardin sharing on a personal level uh, about his experience. And I think that it underlines the importance for us who are Christians not to squelch the honest questions of our own children when they ask them. I know in our own life, I really encouraged my kids to ask the hard questions about the existence of God. And, uh, what Christians believe, because I meet so many uh, people as I travel speaking on different university campuses who have come from Christian backgrounds and who have lost their faith precisely because their questions as children were squelched and told, uh, they were told, well, just believe, you just got to have faith. And I think it's so tragic because these questions are so easily answered. Uh, they are not difficult, uh, I think, to answer, and I'll specifically address that question about who made God in a moment. But first, let's ask ourselves, have we still seen any good reasons to think scientific naturalism is true? Now, Dr. Hardin didn't disagree with the definition I gave of naturalism, that is to say that the natural world is all there is, and that we should only believe what can be scientifically proven. Uh, but I gave our reasons as to why I thought both of those claims are untenable. Since science is by nature limited to the natural world, how could it possibly prove there's nothing beyond the natural world? Uh, I'm still waiting for an answer to that question. And secondly, I argued that it's far too restrictive to say that we should only believe what can be scientifically proven. There are vast realms of truth in ethics, aesthetics, metaphysics, science itself that can't be scientifically proven, but that we all accept and are rational in doing so. And then I argued, in fact, it's self-refuting to say you should only believe what can be scientifically proven. So I, I still think we've not seen any good reasons to think scientific naturalism is the truth, um, nor have we seen any refutation of those objections. Now, with respect to the signposts of transcendence that I offered, Dr. Hardin made some general comments, uh, for example, saying that we should have nothing in words, the motto of the Royal Society. But of course, the many, many of the members of the Royal Society, most when it was founded, who adopted that motto were themselves Christians. Uh, and they did not mean thereby to repudiate religion or, or Christianity. And in fact, in my first speech, that's why I specifically appealed to empirical evidence, not mere words. We looked at things like the origin of the universe in the Big Bang as a signpost of transcendence, the complex order that astrophysicists have discovered in the Big Bang, the existence of objective moral values in the world uh, that we all experience, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and then our experience of God himself. In other words, I've appealed to a broad range of human experience, scientific, ethical, historical, personal, 
And uh, the, all of these, I think, point beyond the natural world to something greater as its ground. Now, Dr. Hardin suggested that the word God has no meaning. Well, as an analytic philosopher, definition of terms is very important to me. And uh, I think I would define the word God in the following way, a personal being who is omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, immaterial, and wholly good. And that's going to be my working definition of what I mean by God. So uh, that's the definition I'm operating with. That's a Christian understanding of God. And if he thinks that that's incoherent, then uh, I simply await the demonstration to hear why that is. Now, let's look then at those signposts of transcendence. First, I said the origin of the universe points beyond itself to, to something greater. And Dr. Hardin agreed that to say something came from nothing is just unacceptable. So there has to be a cause of the origin of the universe. But then he asks, well, who made God? Well, very simply, as I argued in my opening speech, as a cause of space and time itself, the cause of the universe must be an uncaused, immaterial, spaceless, and timeless being. In other words, nobody made God. God didn't come from anywhere. God is what philosophers call an absolutely necessary being. That is a being which is eternal, uncaused, incorruptible, and indestructible. And uh, I would argue that the origin of the universe points to its uh, creation by such an entity. And there certainly is good empirical evidence for this origin. J.M. Wersinger, professor of physics at Auburn University, writing in the National Forum of 1996, says the following. At first, the scientific community was very reluctant to accept the idea of a birth of the universe. Not only did the Big Bang model seem to give in to the Judeo-Christian idea of a beginning of the world, but it also seemed to call for an act of supernatural creation. It took time, observational evidence, and careful verification of predictions made by the Big Bang model to convince the scientific community to accept the idea of a cosmic genesis. The Big Bang is a very successful model that imposed itself upon a reluctant scientific community. So I think we have good grounds for saying the universe has this absolute origin in which space, time, matter, and energy come to exist out of nothing, uh, and that that points beyond itself to its origin in a creator. Secondly, I argue that the complex order of the universe points to the intelligence of this creator uh, because these initial conditions cannot be explained by scientific law because they are initial conditions just put in at the beginning and the odds against them are so incalculable as to be incomprehensible and thus the hypothesis of design seems eminently reasonable. Thirdly, remember I said the existence of objective moral values points to God uh, and again it's hard to see on a naturalistic view how there could be objective moral values. J.P. Moreland uh, a philosopher writes as following, on an evolutionary secular scenario, human beings are nothing special. The universe came from a big bang, it evolved to us through a blind process of chance and necessity. There's nothing intrinsically valuable about human beings in terms of having moral, non-natural properties. The view that being human is special is guilty of speciesism, an unjustifiable bias toward one's own species. So on a naturalistic view, there's no reason to think human beings and their values are any more objective or important than guinea pigs or even mosquitoes. This is especially evident through two implications of a naturalistic worldview. First would be materialism. Uh, on a naturalistic view, you are just a collection of chemicals in a bag of skin. Uh, if a bomb blast destroys a child in Bosnia, all that's happened is that nature has rearranged the collocation of atoms that used to be a little girl. The other implication is determinism. If naturalism is true, then everything that we think and do is determined by our genetic makeup and the input of our five senses. There is no freedom of the will. Our actions have no more moral significance than having a toothache or a, a tree growing a branch. So it's very difficult to see how there could be objective moral values on naturalism. And yet I think it's evident that moral values do exist, that certain things like love are really good, and that there's an objective difference between loving and nurturing a child and torturing and abusing that child. That points beyond the world to God. 
Signpost number four was the resurrection of Jesus. I shared three established facts recognized by historians. I don't know how the naturalist can explain these, frankly. And finally, one's immediate experience of God. I've come to have an experience of God in my own life. He's real to me. I experience God as a living reality. In the absence of any good arguments for atheism, why should I deny my experience and think that I'm having a delusion? In the absence of arguments for atheism, it seems to me that I'm quite within my rights to believe that, in fact, my experience of God is veridical. So on the basis of all of these signposts of transcendence, it seems to me quite reasonable to believe that the natural world is not all there is, that there's more, that there is a creator, a designer, uh, a God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Professor Craig. And now back to you, Professor Harden. Well, I may surprise you, but I'm going to say a few words in favor of faith. But uh, in a very, you'll see a very special circumstance. Um, <laughs> Lucretius. Again, we're back to the first century before Christ. Lucretius wrote uh, a poem on the nature of things in which, with great uh, logical ability, he deduced the existence, really, of the molecular world, that the, these, these solid things weren't really solid. They were made up of little individual particles that could move separately. He called them atoms. The word has changed over the centuries. What he called atoms, we call molecules now. Uh, and that was as far as this idea of molecular theory of matter got, as far as Lucretius carried it then, until the 19th century, when the theory of molecules and molecular theory of matter was developed to a great extent. And the important thing is, uh, how did it get developed? What, what, what do I mean developed? Well, see, what people would be saying would be say, like, show me God, uh, show me a molecule. You can show him a molecule. How can you believe in molecules when you, no, nobody's ever seen one? Difficult point. In uh, 1821, a botanist named Robert Brown uh, reported that if you look in through a microscope at a plant cell at the cytoplasm that moves around, look, if you have enough magnification, you see that individual particles in the cytoplasm are constantly vibrating, constantly. They never give up, never. It's as though there were no friction. This is ridiculous. There's friction every place you look in the world, but there's no friction there. And this sort of shook people up, but mostly just biologists, because there was a lot of separation of the sciences. And it wasn't until the last of the century that people began to see what the significance of this, and the significance is that these things that you see are being bombarded by molecules. And in fact, one of the great, three great, uh, papers that uh, Einstein wrote in 1905 was on the uh, Brownian motion. This is an absolutely important thing. And shortly after that, you know, a few decades, uh, we began to see things that we could say were, you know, one thing I can't see is, what does that number say on there? See, there's light here. You have to work out something else. Five, five minutes. Five, not 50. <laughs> okay, right. I'll make it brief. All right. So that was a, a shaking thing that really convinced many physicists who hadn't been convinced before when they saw, saw molecular motion and said, oh, that really looks convincing. And in this century, finally, we saw things that we could prove were molecules moving. And before then, we had taken it on faith. Now, there's an example of something that's taken on faith. But the point was, it wasn't just taken a broadside on faith. We, the physicists worked out the conclusions, what must be true of these molecules if they are moving the way you say. And they had that all worked out well in advance of actually seeing it. So this, uh, verifying it was sort of an anticlimax. Well, that's the only sense in which faith is used in science. New things that come along often have a great many rough edges, and we do take them on faith for a while, 
But the idea is someday they've got to prove themselves. They've got to get out of this shadow of faith. Uh, otherwise, we won't take them. Thank you, Professor Hardin. <laughs> Back to you, Dr. Craig. Okay, and this is my closing yes. remarks. Um, you remember my fifth signpost of transcendence was the experience of God. And since Dr. Hardin shared a little of his personal life, uh, I'd like to conclude by sharing a little bit of mine. Uh, unlike Professor Hardin, I wasn't raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family. My folks were just good Midwestern folks, but not particularly religious. But when I became a teenager, I began to ask the big questions in life. Who am I? Why am I here? What is the meaning of my, my life and my death? And in the search for answers, I began to attend a large church in our local community just on my own. But what I discovered instead of answers was a social country club where the dues were a dollar a week in the offering plate. And the other high school students who claimed to be such good Christians on Sunday lived for their real God the rest of the week, which was popularity. And this really bothered me because I was living an ex externally a really moral life, and yet I felt so empty inside. And I looked at these other students and I thought, here they claim to be Christians and I'm living a better life than they are. They must be even emptier than I am, but they're just a bunch of phonies, they're a bunch of hypocrites putting up a false face to the world while the real person is hiding down inside afraid to come out and be real. And I grew very resentful toward them for that and this attitude began to spread toward other people. I thought everybody's a phony, they're all fakes and I was on my way to becoming a very alienated young man. I withdrew into my studies and into myself and pretended not to need other people or to want them. And yet at the same time in moments of honesty, I knew that I too wanted to love and to be loved, and that in pretending not to need them, I was just as much a phony and a hypocrite as they were. And so this anger and hatred turned in on myself as well for my own phoniness. And I don't know if you know what this is like, but it just eats away at your insides day after day. And one day I was feeling particularly miserable, and I walked into my high school German class and sat down behind a girl who's one of these types, you know, that is always so happy, it just makes you sick. <laughs> and I tapped her on the shoulder and she turned around and I said, Sandy, what are you always so happy about for anyway? And she said, well, Bill, it's because I know Jesus Christ is my personal savior. And I said, you what? And she, she said, uh, I said, I go to church. And she said, well, Bill, that's not enough. You've got to have him really living in your heart. And I said, well, what would he want to do a thing like that for? And she said, because he loves you, Bill. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Here I was so filled with anger and hate, and she said there was someone who really loved me. And who was it but the God of the universe? And that thought just staggered me. And so during the next six months, I went on the most intense soul-searching period of my life I've ever been through. I read the New Testament from cover to cover. I, I read books. She introduced me to other Christians in the high school. I'd never met people like this. It was like they were in touch with a different plane of reality that I didn't even know existed and, and that I wanted for my life. Well, after this period of six months, to make a long story short, I just came to the end of myself and I just cried out to God one night and uh, just cried out all the anger and the bitterness that was in me. And at the same time, I felt this tremendous infusion of joy just filling me like a balloon being blown up until it was ready to burst. And I remember I rushed outside. It was a warm September evening, and I could see the Milky Way from horizon to horizon. And I looked up at the stars, and I thought, God, I've come to know God. And that moment changed my life. Uh, I had thought enough about this message during those six months to realize that if I ever became a Christian myself, I could do nothing less than spend my entire life telling others about this truth. And that's basically why I'm here tonight in, in this debate, because God got a hold of my life as a teenager, and for the last 30 years, he hasn't let go. As I've walked with him day by day, year by year, he's continued to be an immediate reality to me. And I just want to encourage you, if you haven't found God in that way, to begin to do what I do. Pick up a New Testament. Start to read the Gospels. 
and ask yourself, could this really be the truth? Could there really be a God who created the universe, who loves me, and who has revealed himself in Christ? I believe that it could change your life in the same way that it changed mine. Thank you. Turn now to Professor Hardin. Well, I think I'll complain of unfair labor practices first. Uh, how can you put me after that eloquent statement? <laughs> 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 but curiously, I'm going to tell a story that in a sense is the same story, but it has the opposite conclusion. I think this may be uh, important. I, another story, again, I haven't told it before, uh, when I was, this is 14 years old, high school, I had a friend walked home halfway every day. We lived about a mile and a half from the high school, and at a mile we had to divide. He went to the left, I went to the right. But of course, before we divided, we stood around, and, you know, the way teenagers will do, and talked and talked and talked. We had to solve all the world's problems before we separated. And uh, we got most of them solved. Um, and the occasion that I remember, I was on to religions for some reason or other. I got interested in comparative religions, and I, I was interested in Zoroastrianism. If you ask why, it was because of that lovely sound of the word beginning with Z. And when I discovered that it could be called Zarathustra instead of Zoroastra, I thought, wow, ugly Zarathustra, really. So I, I studied Zoroaster. Now, we separated, we'd been talking about religion, and then I w was walking by myself uh, down a railroad track, as a matter of fact, and all of a sudden, I said out loud, there is no God. And the incredible feeling that I had that I'd never had before, I suddenly was walking on air. The most incredible, I couldn't have weighed more than five pounds. And uh, for the next week or so, I don't know how long, I was still walking there, gradually less and less, and finally I forgot about it. And I didn't see the significance of it until uh, about 20 years later when I read William James' The Varieties of Religious Experience, and he has many accounts there of a person seeing God, seeing the true way uh, to the religious life, and he goes through an experience of that sort, and I realize, well, that's exactly the same thing, because in both cases, one, the person sees God, the other person sees there is no God, but his difficulties are resolved in that moment, and from then on, he's a true believer or a true unbeliever. I became a true unbeliever. Thank you very much, Professor Harden. This is the Veritas Forum, and Veritas means truth. And uh, we've heard from uh, two very distinguished gentlemen who have uh, spent their lives, basically, uh, looking for truth. They've, they've uh, done it differently, and they've come to different conclusions. But I think we all respect and admire the honesty uh, with which they presented their views. Now is the time where we have audience participation, and I'd like to um, alternate questions, uh, one to one speaker and then to the other. And I'm not, um, Art or John or somebody tell me, are these mics set up for that purpose to ask questions? Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, I guess I would ask um, anyone who wishes to ask questions or make comments uh, to either of the speakers to come forward there's one microphone over here uh, near Professor Hardin and one on the other side uh, near Professor Craig. It would be best to have questions for one speaker from one and then one yes. for the other. So. Yes, exactly. We'll try to, we'll try to, to, to alternate. But and I mean, have, have everybody for once, for one of us, line up behind one of microphone oh, okay. and well, let's, let's for the do other, that. and that way you don't get mixed up. Okay, fine. So would people who have questions primarily for Professor Craig uh, step toward that microphone and those primarily with questions for Professor Hardin um, to that microphone. You keep uh, coming, coming forward. We're only going to hear one of you at a time, but you can keep on lining up. Um, 
but if, if, if you wouldn't mind being, being quiet now so that we can hear the, so that we can hear the first question. And um, the first question, Professor Hardin, please. Dr. Hardin, I wanted to bring up the third signpost that Dr. Craig uh, mentioned, and that is the existence of moral values. And I want to ask, do you believe in objective moral values? And if so, how does that square with scientific naturalism? I suppose I would uh, remove, say the word objective does not apply to moral values. I don't know what one to use. Uh, because I think they're rational in some sense, and I think the people who are coming at this through a uh, theory of altruism, which is a tremendous uh, amount of uh, literature on this now, are getting at it the right way. In other words, these, these are the things that work. And I wouldn't call them moral, I'd just say that they work, and if you want to be reasonably happy and make, making the best of life, follow those. All right, first question, Professor Craig. Yes, uh, regarding the issue of, of an absolute moralism, I was raised Roman Catholic, and one of the absolute fundamental moral values I was raised with was that it is wrong inherently to terminate a, a human life, to kill people. And that's one of the Ten Commandments, and it made a lot of sense to me. Then, as I grew older, I learned that it was okay sometimes to kill people, for example, in times of war, self-defense, uh, capital punishment, abortion, things like that. It was okay to terminate a human life. Um, in view of that, I mean, to me, that, sound, that seems like a very fundamental issue, and it seems to be an issue in which people pretty much, they allow their morals to wrap around whatever's convenient at the time. If we're in a war, okay, it's okay to kill people then, or in, in self-defense, but in general, it's not okay to kill people. To me, that, that defies kind of a absolute moralism, and it seems to indicate more of a human uh, aspect than one of God. And one quick point I wanted to make as well, um, the idea that I'm just a bunch of atoms in a sack of, of, uh, of fluid, to me, I find to be fantastic and incredible. And when I look up at the scar stars in the sky in the evening, I see such wonder that I'm a part of this universe and that I'm actually aware of that. And I can see it, that it doesn't seem meaningless to me at all. And it doesn't all require right. God. It seems to me that the two sentiments you've expressed are contradictory. They move in opposite directions. On the one hand, you seem to want to affirm some absolute moral truths and that these shouldn't be conveniently wrapped around our situations. And yet, on the other hand, you seem not to want to affirm that we're more than just a bag of chemicals on bones. Uh, those seem to move, move in opposite directions, it seems to me. If you do affirm that there are, that, that human life is intrinsically valuable, that people are ends and not means, then we are not simply bags of chemicals because you can take a bag of chemicals and rip it open with a knife and spew the contents out on the ground and that would be nothing immoral. But I think you would agree probably that if you were to go and do that to another human being, that would be immoral. That would be wrong. That would be a violation of their human worth and dignity. Now, I think that with respect to the former question though, um, ethical principles clearly have to be applied to various situations. Uh, and general ethical truths have to be applied in specific cases. What I'm saying when I say there are objective values is that in any specific case, there is an objectively right thing to do and an objectively wrong thing to do. For example, I think you could say it's a general moral principle that you should not murder innocent people. Uh, and if people want to twist that around to meet human conventions, then I think they're simply wrong in doing so. And, and, uh, and uh, therefore, they're, they're, they're incorrect when they want to do that. I think it is always wrong to murder innocent people. So with respect to abortion, the whole issue there depends on whether or not you believe in the humanity of the fetus. If you believe in the humanity of the fetus, then the fetus is a human being, and to kill it is, is homicide. It's wrong. If you don't believe in the humanity of the fetus, if you think it's just again, a bag of chemicals, then you don't think you're committing homicide. So uh, that would be an example of where you would apply the ethical principle in a specific case. 
Thank Next you. question for Professor. I'm sorry, do you I want to want comment? To I, I, I hate to leave this as it is. <laughs> um, uh, right. I, I, the language, I think, is deceiving us when we speak of we should not murder an innocent person. What you have done is said the same thing twice. The Bible, the Old Testament, which is where the uh, Ten Commandments are found, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Hebrew says, thou shalt not do murder. It does not say thou shalt not kill. And of course, if you read the Old Testament, the amount of killing that goes on there at the specific behest of God is amazing. Uh, it recognizes that under conditions of war, et cetera, et cetera, killing may be uh, acceptable. Yes. Do you call it murder when it isn't? And this is one of the great harms that was done in the translation of the King James Bible. It says, thou shalt not kill. That is not uh, part of the original document at all, thou shalt not murder, which is an utterly different thing. And as for the other part of that, that this is a human being, the law has always, well, until the time of uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, there was great uncertainty, and uh, Aquinas thought he settled this by saying that when the first movements are felt by the woman, that is when life, human life, enters the this thing that's there, and uh, from then on, a human being should have rights. Uh, then, of course, later, in the 19th century, we found uh, that there is no such thing as life ever beginning. It is merely passed on, and there's always life in some place or other, and the question is, what about the loss of the life of uh, a being that is so small you can scarcely see it with the naked eye? What about, is that really serious? Well, at this point, I think we have to be uh, influenced by the facts of biology. And the facts of biology, which have been well established, is that in the higher mammals, approximately one half of all conceptuses are spontaneously aborted, spontaneously aborted. That means in the United States, there are about four million spontaneous abortions every year, to which we have to add another million or maybe million and a half of uh, deliberate abortions. But they're spontaneously aborted at so early a stage that the woman first thinks she has had a late period. I mean, first she thinks she's pregnant. Then she has a period after all. She says, oh, it was just delayed. So you see, having learned that there are four million spontaneous abortions, this throws an utterly new light on the thought that anything that has 46 chromosomes in it of the right sort is a human being. And we sh really should go back to stick with the uh, time-honored uh, legal principle that it's not a human being until it is born alive. Before then, it's not a human being. You deal with it some other way. All right, I'd like to give Professor Craig uh, a few minutes to respond to that, and then I think we need to go back to, uh, to the audience uh, questions. But uh, Well, I guess I think we basically agree that the issue is, is the fetus human? Uh, and if the fetus is human, then to kill it would be homicide. I think we agree on that general principle. So the question is, the biological question is, is this a human being? And I find it incredible to think that, say, a baby at eight months gestation, uh, which if born premature would survive, is not a human being just because it's geographically located inside the uterus instead of outside of it. So, um, but let, let uh, let me also respond to the point about the spontaneous abortions uh, or miscarriages. I don't think that argument's very persuasive because an analogous argument would be, look, every human being dies eventually. Therefore, there's nothing wrong with ending somebody's life because they're all going to, you know, they're going to die anyway. That's sort of the same sort of reasoning. Many of these uh, uh, fetuses die spontaneously. Therefore, it's nothing wrong with your killing such a being. Uh, that's like saying because human beings all are mortal and die by accidents and disease and so forth, therefore it's all right to kill them. That just seems illogical to me. Okay. I have a feeling this question may crop up again, but let's let it come from the audience if it does. Uh, question, <laughs> Professor Hardin. My name is John Thorndike, Professor, and I, I'm an admirer of yours, and I, I certainly thank you for being here and doing this because I'm a Christian. 
But uh, I, my question is, um, and especially because of that, uh, I, I believe that we only un understand, you, you quoted the old scripture and the new, we only understand the old through the new. So therefore, when you quote the uh, uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, that uh, 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 it, explains, it explains God in, in the beginning, in the beginning God. And, and, and I feel that, uh, that when you say, um, you know, you were profoundly affected at a very young age, at, at, at age uh, six or seven, going hunting with your dad, your grandfather had uh, passed on and, and, and you asked a very valid question. You didn't get an answer that, uh, that uh, you would be fighting for those answers now, you know? So I, 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 I would like to, to quote you quoting John, and then add uh, the, 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 what it says in the beginning, in the beginning God. Well, you, you said in the beginning, quoting, uh, I, 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 I missed a word, and tell me if I'm right or wrong. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. I, I, I think it's, uh, it should be, and the word was with God and the Word was God. Is that right? That's right. The Word right. was with God and the Word was God. Right. And, and if we take that and we add to it, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, we have the Word because the Word says, let there be light. And the Word says, let there be so forth and so forth and so forth. So, so that Word spoke the earth into existence. That word spoke the Big Bang. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's, that's all I had to say. <laughs> Any comment on that, Professor Hardin? I... <laughs> <laughs> That, that was a very clever exegesis, I think. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I'd say is that what that says to me is this is an honest statement of a person who thinks you create truth by using words. And see, I, I go along with Einstein here. I think the, the thoughts come first, and then later, much later, you find words at more or less depth. And this is an utterly different attitude. I don't think, I th I don't think words can create any, anything except trouble. <laughs> Question of Professor Craig. Yes. Uh, well, I'd like to clarify some of those words so uh, we don't uh, create more trouble. Uh, I thought the debate was against Christianity versus naturalism, and I heard you give evidence for Christianity, uh, Dr. Craig, and, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Hardin give evidence uh, for science. But I'm concerned about this word naturalism and the audience understanding it. And perhaps I can uh, give an example and ask you to respond to it, if I might. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1995 position statement from the National Association of Biology Teachers stated that all life on Earth was the result of evolution, defined as an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable natural process. Now the question is, is that statement science or is it naturalism masquerading as science. Thank you. Well, I think that it is clearly uh, naturalism insofar as it says that the process was unsupervised and what was the other word, unplanned? Uh, impersonal. I impersonal. Imp impersonal, because un unpredictable natural process. Yeah, insofar as you say it's unsupervised and, and impersonal, that is implicitly making a metaphysical statement that there is no God who's beyond it. And it seems to me that science uh, cannot make that statement, and therefore that statement is a naturalistic statement. It's an expression of a philosophy. And uh, I appreciate the point that you're making is that it is not Christianity versus science. I mean, on the contrary, I've tried to appeal, at least in two of my signposts, to science to point in the direction of a transcendent ground. But 
but this, this statement by the National Association of Biology teachers was, as you know, I think, revised precisely because they realized that it was making a metaphysical uh, statement that went beyond the bounds of what science would allow one to say. On, on the basis of science alone, you could not say that it was unsupervised and impersonal. So you're very right to draw attention to the fact that we're comparing here two philosophies, naturalism and theism. That's, that's where the debate lies. Perhaps uh, if somebody else doesn't ask it, I, I'd like to, of uh, uh, Dr. Hardin as well. Is there any evidence for naturalism? Not any for evidence science, for naturalism? Is there any, would you, would you give evidences uh, for naturalism, that naturalism is true? I'm sorry, I, I'm dealing in a world in which that's the only way we attack any problems. It doesn't mean there aren't other things, I just don't find them of any interest. Okay, a question for Professor Hardin. Um, Professor Hardin, what did you base your, be your belief that there was no God on? I'm sorry, what was that? What did you base your belief that there is no God? Oh, what did I'm, you base that on? I'm sorry, I'll have to really quick go over this. Uh, I think I'll, I'll enlarge some on what Dr. Craig said uh, in a particular way. Suppose somebody said, there is a human being in this room. Now, I think that would correspond to the theistic position. I think there is at least one human being in this room, so we don't argue about that. All right. Now, a person says, there is an elephant in this room. I think, after looking around thoroughly, I think you'd be willing to take an atheistic position. See, I'm stretching the word atheistic. You'd say, a, a elephantistic. <laughs> well, there's, there's an, you know, you, I've looked every place and I haven't seen an elephant. I, I'm willing to go the, the extreme position, say there is no elephant in this room. But if you say there is a flea in this room, F-L-E-A, I will not say there is not a flea in this room. There may well be one, and I find it difficult to imagine the circumstance under which I would say bet a thousand dollars there's not a single flea in this room. You see, so in that case, I would take the position which was first labeled in 1869 by Thomas Huxley, who was Darwin's bulldog. At a party, he had to invent real quick, and he invented words, said, oh, he said, I'm an agnostic. I don't say there is a God. I don't say there isn't a God. I say I don't know. And this science has some questions on which it, it takes an agnostic position maybe for decades at a time. Then may, sometimes one of those is resolved and it flops one way or the other. So there are these three possibilities. And uh, as far as God itself is concerned, uh, this is a question of taste. Uh, whether you say, I am an atheist or an agnostic. I prefer to say I'm an agnostic, just as I am not willing to say there's not a flea in this room. Yes, sir. I would like to take a, a slightly different approach. Uh, I believe that religion is very little to do with God. It is merely man's search for meaning in this life and his pursuit of God. But in reality, God pursues us. I was delighted tonight to hear both speakers, especially Professor Hardin, get very personal. And it's very easy to understand what happens when a theory is wrong. It is just replaced by another theory. But both speakers tonight were very personal. And what I would like the speakers to do, starting with Professor Hardin, Professor Hardin, I'd like you to explain to Professor Craig the consequences in life and death if he is wrong. And then I would like Professor Craig to explain to Professor Hardin the consequences in life and death if he is wrong. <laughs> well, that's a nice thank, big Thank goodness for I defined agnostic already. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, let me just say this. I, I think that what the questioner has hit upon in, uh, in a colloquial way is 
a famous wager argument of Blaise Pascal, the great French physicist and mathematician. Pascal's wager basically said that if you, uh, he says in life, we're all, we all have to gamble on God or not. Uh, we can't choose not to play. He says the game is in progress. How will you bet? And Pascal said that, and he was the inventor of probability theory, so he knew what he was talking about. Pascal said that if God exists and you bet that he does not, then you suffer infinite loss. Uh, if you bet that God does exist and uh, he, uh, in fact, does, then you have infinite gain. And therefore, he argued that it's the more prudent of the two courses to bet that God exists because the infinite gain just swamps the, the infinite loss that you would experience otherwise. And it seems to me that in a case where the evidence is equally balanced, that these kind of prudential arguments are quite correct, that when the evidence is equal, that one ought to go on the basis of these sorts of prudential sorts of considerations. And so I would think that Pascal's argument is, is correct there and that one should wager on God if the evidence is equal. But of course, I don't think the evidence is equal. I think there are good grounds for believing that God exists and that therefore the side of the scale containing the weight of the evidence in favor of God, I think, uh, outweighs the side of the scale having whatever evidence there might be thought to be for naturalism. I have a very brief thing that I want to say. I was thinking, uh, looking at this as the man from Mars and looking at the man from Mars saying, well, now, what position does this put God in? Uh, I've been informed that God is omniscient, that he knows everything. At this point, God knows what Pascal is doing and why he's doing it. He says, oh, that sneaky mathematician. <laughs> he thinks he'll get into heaven with that trick. He won't. To hell with him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, ma'am. Professor Hardin, um, I'd like to know where you think that you're going to go when you die. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like, uh, you know, there's one of Mark Twain's essays, maybe there's more than one, which he uh, faces up to, which was a very a living possibility in his day, in the 1880s, 1890s, and so on, that uh, people, uh, Christians thought they would, when they died, then they'd go into heaven, they'd have wings, they'd flap, and they'd sing all day long. He said, well, it should sure be exciting to fly with your own wings, but by about the second day, you'd get sick and tired of those songs, and the third day, and the fourth day, and the fifth day, and he came to the conclusion that he would rather go to hell. It's probably a lot more interesting. So... Oh. Um, I'm still not clear where you think that you're going to be going. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think it's all a figment of the imagination, and we think human beings are special. I don't know. I've, I've had some dogs that I were very fond of, and if I've ever seen soulful eyes, there are soulful eyes in the dog. And uh, the thought of my going to heaven and not having a dog with me uh, I don't like that at all. I think that's un that's segregation. That's no <laughs> yes, sir. Um, was it your second pillar that dealt with the statistics of the beginning of the universe? Oh, and um, I'm trying to remember the exact word, but did you say that it was inconceivable that such a thing could happen? I that said that to describe? I said that the odds against the universe being life permitting were so small as to be incomprehensible and incalculable. Okay. Well. Um, um, having read Hardin's book about the filters, I recognize that as language that uh, is intended to prevent thought. And using his numerate fil filter, um, I would say that it's um, not quite right to do a statistical analysis of this because we only have one sample. Mm -hmm. We don't have a random da data set. The only universe we have is one in which life has uh, propagated. And so it's, it's not quite fair to um, compare that to the statistics of life not being able to exist in the universe, or a universe not being able to exist, because there are no humans around in such an instance to declare that life hasn't existed. Yes, this is a, a, an, an objection that one sometimes sees in the literature. But I think for those who understand 
the uh, fine-tuning argument, it's not difficult to explain the sense of probability and the set of the sample set that one is talking about. In his book, uh, The World Within the World, the Oxford physicist John Barrow gives the following illustration that I find very helpful. He said, uh, make a dot on a piece of paper and let that be the universe. Make it a red dot, and that is our universe. Now he says, alter slightly some of these constants, like the proton-neutron mass ratio, or the strength of the weak force, or the expansion of the universe, and let that be a new universe. And if it's life permitting, make it a red dot. If it's life prohibiting, make it a blue dot. And then alter them again and make another dot. And then alter it again and another dot. And you just keep doing this, altering these constants slightly. And until your paper is filled with universes or filled with dots. And what you discover is that you have a sea of blue with just a few pinpoints of red uh, here or there. And that's the sense in which one means that it is enormously and incomprehensibly improbable that the universe should be life permitting. Your, your sample set of universes is all of these other possible universes that result just by altering these parameters in these very, very small ways. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Hardin, uh, would you agree with me if, if I made the statement that in today's world, the scope of mankind's knowledge is growing exponentially? I'm afraid I would. And as, along with that, the problem of information overload becomes ever more important. There's an awful lot of knowledge, and it takes a long time sometimes to, uh, to realize it's out there, and I, I'm worried about that. And finally, we may get to the point where we're so overloaded, even with all the uh, computerized aids that we use. So those don't really change the problem significantly. You know, a pe person has a computer, and he plugs into one of these uh, indexes, really, and he gets back 150,000 entries. Well, who's going to read 150,000 entries before lunch? Mm -hmm. You know, you find says, oh, to hell with it, and out they go, you see. This is a information overload, and I think it's a serious problem. Isn't it also true, then, that uh, for every discovery or observation that proves a new theory, that it tends to open Pandora's box from the standpoint of now we have a new plethora of questions? Well, I would say that this is where uh, the ecolate way of thinking comes in, that the reason ecology is so hated by people and environmentalism, which is based on ecology, mm -hmm. is because it shows uh, the significance of unforeseen consequences. People design, I mean, say the World Bank uh, is approached to build a dam someplace that's going to cost $3 billion, and they love to spend money, so they send $3 billion there to build a dam, and then they get through and they discover that if you add it all up, they've probably done more harm than good. I mean, this is mm -hmm. the case with dam after dam. As I understand, the World Bank is not taking on any new dams from now on. Mm -hmm. they've, they've become so disgusted with what they do. See, the Chinese are now building the world's biggest dam. They're going to displace a million people, mm -hmm. displace them from uh, where the dam has to be, from the some of the richest land in China. And of course, they'll give each one some money and say, go buy another farm. Another farm in China? Where? Mm -hmm. You see, uh, this is a case of, this is what ecology does. It, it says you've got to look for the unforeseen consequences and foresee them in advance and make your decision on the total uh, picture. And since the picture is never completely total, that means that you're never completely satisfied with what you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're um, getting um, past our time, and I think that's okay. I want to remind you that, um, that there will be a coffee house in the multi Multicultural Center at the USEN after this. So if there's not time, if, if you're in line and there's not time for you to ask your question, uh, you will have an opportunity to do that at that time uh, and in that place. But I will, uh, I will let this go on for a few more minutes. I don't see any point in, in rushing through. So there's a question there, sir. 
Uh, well, I think it's time to turn to another question. Well, we do I have just had to... one, one final thing, and, and that Here. was, um, you know, I'm not a scientist, but as the more I've learned about science and the sciences of all types in my life, the more uh, daunting it is to realize that no matter how much we learn, the folly of mankind will never be any closer to complete knowledge. If anything, complete knowledge gets further and further away. And this is just a humbling thought. Okay, yes, sir. Um, it seems to me that uh, traditionally God is just simply a way of explaining the unexplainable, whether it be the ancient Egyptians using God to explain a drought or it's the ancient Greeks using God to explain the sun rising and setting, or the 20th century using God to explain the Big Bang or to explain the creation of the universe. And I mean, ultimately, God is just a way of answering questions that we don't have the knowledge yet to answer. So isn't it slightly arrogant of us as humans in this day and age to assume that this time we've got it right, mm -hmm. that this time we know that God is the answer, yeah. whereas, as shown many times before, it's failed. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, this raises the old so-called God of the gaps issue. You know, are we just punting to God to kind of plug up the gaps in our scientific knowledge? And certainly, one would be very skeptical if, if that's the route I were trying to take, and I would share with you a real concern about that. But I want to emphasize that in, in the arguments that I've given, I gave two scientific arguments, the first and the second. Now, of course, the ethical argument wouldn't be affected by what you're saying, but the first two were scientific, and they were based not upon gaps in our scientific knowledge, but rather on what the best of scientific knowledge does tell us, so that it wasn't an appeal to God to plug a gap or to fill in ignorance, but rather it's saying that the best scientific evidence we have indicates that space and time are finite in the past, that the universe did begin to exist, that it did have this incredible complex fine-tuning of the initial conditions there, and that these are signposts that point beyond it to some greater reality as its explanation. And uh, it just, I think, the, whether these arguments are worthy or not uh, depends upon how convincing the evidence is that in fact the universe had a beginning and that it does have these complex initial conditions. And I think the evidence is quite good that, that it does. Let me try to get at this another way too though that I think can be helpful and that is these arguments can also be put in deductive forms so that they're not really appealing to God as an explanatory entity but rather they're simply deductive arguments. For example, the first argument can be stated in the following way. Premise one, Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, three, the universe has a cause. And then you unpack what it is to be a cause of the universe in terms of timelessness, spacelessness, immateriality, and so forth. Now, in a deductive argument like that, if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows logically and inescapably, whether you like it or not. And it seems to me that with regard to those two premises, they are both more plausibly true than their negations. Particularly that second premise, the universe began to exist. That's not a religious statement. That's a statement you can find in any textbook on astrophysics or cosmology. And it certainly seems to be to me more probably true than its negation. So when you put it in the form of a deductive argument like that, I think that it gives, it's a good argument for that conclusion. And the second argument can also be put in a deductive form. It would be premise one, the initial conditions of the universe are due either to law, chance, or intelligence. Premise two, the initial conditions are not due to chance or law. Therefore, premise th or number three, they are due to intelligence. And again, it all depends on whether or not those premises are true, and, and I think that they are certainly more plausibly true than their negations, and, and therefore the conclusion would follow deductively and, and logically. Well, isn't it true, though, that uh, just because the law hasn't been discovered yet doesn't mean that the law doesn't necessarily exist? Of course that's true. That's absolutely right. But uh, then it, it's a matter of uh, plausibility or probability. Are these truly initial conditions, 
or are these somehow intricately related in some way that we don't know? And uh, the best scientific evidence is that these are not related, that these are truly contingent features, that there isn't any inherent connection, say, between the ratio of matter over antimatter and the expansion speed of the universe or of, uh, or the uh, entropy of the universe put in at the initial conditions. These initial conditions are not the result of some higher logical law, but seem to be genuinely contingent, non-law-like quantities that are just put in at the beginning as initial conditions. Okay, um, I think we probably have time for only a couple of more uh, formal questions here. Uh, uh, so, ma'am, uh, please go ahead. Hi. I first of all would like to thank UCSB for holding the Veritas Forum. Um, I have a short comment and a question. First off, in um, Professor Hardin's um, use of John 1.1, 1, 1, which is written not to the Hebrews but to non-Jewish Christians, about how um, the word was, first there was the word. Um, the Greek word in the, found in the Septuagint is logos, which translates to mean divine mind, not actual words. So um, I really didn't understand where you're going with that, with that knowledge. I didn't get that. Um, Thank you. I don't know if you had more to say about that or? No, this is all new to me. OK. Um, and then secondly, you say you're, ag you're agnostic. And it's kind of funny that Gnosticism means um, knowledge. And you say you don't know, so I think it's kind of funny. But um, <laughs> but then you say um, you're an agnostic. But then in your story, you said there's no God. So how can you say there's no God when you claim you don't know? And after you said that there's no God, you had this huge spiritual uplifting um, peace of mind and peace of heart and peace of all your questions when you don't know. Oh, well, you see, but I was 14 then. I hadn't heard of T.H. Huxley yet. You see, Huxley introduced the term agnostic. I didn't know about it. I did the best I could, and I decided, I, I said, there is no God, uh, but this was if I'd been challenged and I'd been reminded of Huxley's uh, work, I would have said, well, I'm an agnostic. But then you said that your, that moment made you a true unbeliever. Are you still a true unbeliever? Are oh, you... I suppose not. I was just being, trying to be witty and failing. <laughs> <laughs> See, there, there is a book called The True Believer, which I heartily recommend to you. Uh, a, a, a man who uh, educated himself in philosophy, it's a perfectly amazing thing, uh, a worker, a field worker, it's quite a remarkable uh, book. And uh, I was playing on that. You see, he, he was a true believer. I mean, he was talking about true believers. Not a, he wasn't a true believer. Uh, and I said, well, I'm sort of a true unbeliever. But that, forget about it. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank both the speakers for coming tonight and sharing their views with us. Uh, I find it quite informative. And I think what this forum, is, what is raised to me is not exactly which one is better to seek the truth, but why are we seeking that truth? In regards to the universe and its being infinitely almost impossible for it to create, to <clears throat> sustain life, the question is, I think, why do we need to be here? Uh, not ex how special do we have to be? How fragile is the human ego that it needs a reason to be here instead of just being here? Why is it that we need to create something higher than us that needed to create us? And I think that's something, is, is religion more of an aspect to verify that we're special and that we're here for a reason? Or is it something different? Well, I guess the, I think that the, the existential issue that's here is that human beings, I think, have always sought for the questions of the meaning of their lives. I mean, this was what faced me as a teenager when I thought about my death, that someday I was going to die. I asked, what then is the meaning of life if it all ends in death, whether I live a good life or a bad life, whether I live as a... <clears throat> 
you know, <clears throat> uh, someone who just lives for self and pleasure or someone who lives for the good of others, what difference does it make if I end up the same? What is the meaning of my life in light of my death? So I think these are profound existential questions that we need to ask. And if we're not to just delude ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, is there evidence of some transcendent purpose or meaning or reason for our existence? Because I very, very vehemently reject the idea that we need to invent God in order to give meaning to life. That I would regard as detestable. You, you can't uh, invent the truth because you, you want something to be that way. You have to ask yourself, is it really that way? And so I think out of this profound existential human predicament, we look at the universe and ask ourselves, is the natural world all there is? Or is there some greater reason and transcendent ground for it? And as I said, for the reasons I gave, I'm persuaded that there really is, and that this isn't just the product of human invention. Thank you. Let me make some con concluding remarks. First of all, to remind you uh, to please fill out your response cards and put them in the box in the back, or you can mail them in uh, later. A box for donations in the back. Uh, and order forms for tapes uh, and videos also in the back. Uh, I am sorry for those people who have been standing in line uh, waiting, but it is uh, time for the coffee house, and I suggest that, that you be the first people to address the speakers that you want to when we get to the uh, coffee house in a few moments. Thanks to both of our speakers.